they're rearranging just a little bit. Uh, yesterday, about 5 o'clock, I uh, had a wedding, and um, it was so cool. It wasn't a large crowd or anything like that, but it was just one of those kind of weddings that just really made an impression on me. And uh, part of it was that uh, this particular couple did not want to see one another uh, before the wedding. And that used to be, you know, traditional all the time, but it's not so much anymore. So that kind of uh, caught my attention. And uh, so bride and groom don't see one another. We all, you know, the wedding party all comes down and the groom is standing right there. This guy is like handsome, okay? And uh, he, he does something like the, the military reserves or something like that. I don't know what form of military it is. Um, but he's also extraordinarily muscular, okay? So he's kind of a hunk, okay? I don't know how else to say it, all right? He's a good-looking guy. He's built, and uh, he has this really cool spirit about him. He can be very strong and bold, but he also has this really cool kind of tenderness and gentleness about it. So I've really connected with Will along through our premarital counseling. Um, Chandler, on the other hand, I mean, well, she's not in the military. She is just a really beautiful young woman. She's very tall. Uh, she has uh, long, and I think it's naturally kind of wavy, dark hair. It's real long, and uh, real dark eyes, and uh, just an attractive young woman, too. So um, I'm watching, okay? We get everybody up here. Will is right there. And we're waiting for that moment when Chandler kind of comes around the back and is ready to come in. And she comes in, and if you could have seen Will's face, it was worth a lot of money in my book, okay? That guy just about melted right into the floor there because he, he was just awed by his almost wife's beauty, you know, and just her spirit and their love. You could just about see it jumping back and forth from the uh, front to the back of the sanctuary. It was so, so cool. And when they got up here and he finally had the chance to take her hand, he did not let go, and neither did she, you know? It's just one of those special loves. Now, here's the other part of the story. We finished the ceremony, and uh, they were getting ready to go outside, so I opened these doors over here. And they went out first, which is a little different than a lot of uh, weddings do this, but they went out first. And um, so Will kind of leads the way a little bit, but they're holding hands. <clears throat> Pardon me. And uh, as they walk by me, I hear him say to her, you are so pretty. Now, doesn't that do something for a wife? Okay, to have her husband say that? Guys, you ought to say that every day, whether it's true or not, okay? Just say it, all right? It's a good thing, but I was really inspired, and I was so glad that we are the type of church that is willing to be a part of people's big experiences in life. You know, they're not members here, but uh, we got to know them. We built some relationship. Uh, Tim, who works our sound for weddings, and Joyce, our wedding coordinator, Nita, who plays on the organ, uh, and myself, we all built relationships with this couple. Who knows what the Holy Spirit may do with that? But we did, for them, pronounce God's blessing on their love and on their marriage. All right. What were all those palm branches about, kids? Palm Sunday, you nailed it. Okay, so today is Palm Sunday, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit of the story about Palm Sunday that comes out of the Bible. Jesus is riding through the gates on the back of a donkey. The large crowd is cheering and singing and waving palm branches, just like our kids did. And they're there to meet Jesus as he enters in to the city of Jerusalem. The city is packed with visitors who have come to celebrate the Passover festival. The festival reminds the, of the, time, reminds the people of the time a long time ago when the Lord God saved his people. Everyone's looking forward to later in the week when they'll gather in homes and small groups all around the city of Jerusalem to share in the Passover meal. The meal will be filled with different foods that remind them of God's saving grace. They'll remember and be thankful for how the Lord passed over the Israelites while the Lord brought judgment 
on the Egyptians. For the people in the city that day, at that poem parade, the Passover is a celebration of God's desire, but also his power to save his people. So as Jesus leads the poem parade in the si into the city during Passover, it's easy for all of the people to believe that Jesus was coming to save them, just like the Lord God had saved them so long ago. They're convinced that Jesus' donkey ride is ushering in the fullness of the kingdom of God on earth. Now, however, the kingdom of God will never come in all of its uh, fullness with just a donkey or some waving of palm branches. The Passover festival reminds the people on that day, but it also reminds us today that the Lord passed over the Israelites only when they smeared the blood of a lamb around the door frame of the front door of their house. What that tells them and tells us is that our salvation is only possible through the blood sacrifice of a lamb. Now most of us aren't into animal sacrifice, okay? Um, unless it's on the grill in the backyard, we might do that. But the good news is this, Jesus is the perfect lamb of God. Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God. Now, let's think about this week that goes from what we now call Palm Sunday up to Easter. Jesus begins the week with a parade of waving palms and excited songs and wild cheers. Sounds like worship here at 9 o'clock, doesn't it? Okay. Jesus ends the week, however, with a parade of oozing blood, intense suffering, and gruesome death. Let me say it another way. Jesus enters on a donkey as the Prince of Peace. He finishes on a cross as the Lamb of God. It matters more how Jesus finishes the week than how he begins the week. The same principle holds true for you and me. No matter how your life has begun, no matter how it has begun or how your life is going today, the most important thing for your soul work is finishing well. The beginning doesn't matter that much, not near as much as how it ends. The Apostle Paul is a great example of this. His beginning was not that great. He was raised a devout Jew, nothing wrong with that. But then he became involved in a movement to destroy the early Christian church. At some point, he gave his life to Christ. And guess what happened? His life became filled with pain and suffering and all kinds of injustice directed at him. So later in his life, Paul is reflecting on how his life began how it was painful sometimes and not fair, and then how he hoped it would finish. And he writes this letter to a young pastor named Timothy. And we have this in the second letter to Timothy. It's chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul writes this. You've heard some of these words probably. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. All of those phrases are about finishing well. That's what they're about. Paul is telling Timothy that finishing well is much more important than how he began. And that's true for us too. It doesn't matter how you've messed things up. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are today. It doesn't matter what happened to you when you were 11. It doesn't ha matter what happened to you a couple of years ago. It matters and we care, but it doesn't matter near as much, near as much is how you finish. And yet it's easy to get so focused on what happened in the past or what our life looks like right now that we don't keep the finish line in view. Think about the prayers that we have uh, shared here uh, at First Church during just the past few weeks. We prayed for the grandparents of a newborn baby who died. We prayed for the parents of a young child just diagnosed with a very serious cancer. We prayed for a husband entering into the very last stages of cancer. 
Now, in addition to those prayers that we have shared out loud, there have probably been hundreds, if not thousands, more prayers said in silence during worship. Prayers offered by those who cannot shake the betrayal or the abuse or the neglect that they've experienced in the past. Prayers offered by those who cannot get past the brokenness of a relationship that still hurts as much today as it did a few years ago. Prayers offered uh, by those who have this growing anxiety about the financial struggles that are going to come in, in later this month. When life is difficult and disappointing like that, it's easy to get distracted and discouraged because of what is happening to us or even around us. So when it feels like there's more hurt than hope, the Bible invites us to focus on finishing well. Not to focus on, on the difficulty of today or the pain of the past, but to focus on finishing well. That's where we invest our soul work. In Colossians 3.3, 3, the Apostle Paul writes these words. Now set your heart, when you hear that word, hear soul. Now set your soul on what is in heaven, where Christ rules at God's right side. Paul's inviting us here, another way to say it. He's inviting our soul work to be focused on heaven and on Jesus. In his book uh, titled, How's Your Soul?, Pastor Judah Smith puts it this way, we are to live in the light of the reality of heaven. And when we do that, what it does is that every day, every difficult moment, we're going to take into account the blessings of God and the, the presence of Jesus and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So the invitation of the Scripture is to focus our soul work on the finish line, more so than we do right now. The good news is the Lord God has created us with a deep desire for this finish line. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you believe about God, or even if you don't believe in God, when we take our first breath, there is already the desire planted in us so deep we will never be able to shake it. And it's our heart's desire, it's our heart's desire for the finish line. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says this very well. God has made everything beautiful in its time. Now listen to this. He has also set eternity in the human heart. He doesn't say some. It's in every one of us. He has set eternity or heaven in the human heart. So rather than waiting for later, we can choose to focus on the finish line now. We can let our perspective of the past and the pain of today be seen always through the promise of heaven and the presence of Jesus. Let's go back to Colossians again. It's chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says, you have been raised to life with Christ. That's talking about our salvation when we open our heart, mind, and soul to Jesus. You have been raised to life with Christ. Now, set your heart on what is in heaven where Christ rules at God's right side. And then this statement I really like. Think about what is up there, not about what is here on earth. That's all about the finish line. On that Palm Sunday, the people crowding around Jesus with their palm branches needed relief from the oppression, abuse, and violence that was all around them. Everywhere they looked in their lives, there was injustice and fear and pain. They needed to focus on something or someone that would give them hope and help and healing. They found their hope when they focused upon the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Going back to Colossians again, it's verse 4. Christ gives meaning to your life, and when he appears, you also will appear with him in glory. When we keep our heart set on the finish line of joining Jesus in heaven, we find hope for today, and we find meaning for life. So let me ask, what do you want your life to look like at the finish line? Now, if you're like 80 years old, you already have an answer. 
If you're 20 years old, maybe not so much, okay? Some age and stage and phase of life makes some difference with this. But what do you want your life to look like at the finish line? What do you want it to look like? Imagine leaving a spiritual legacy for the next generation of Christ followers. Maybe it's just one person coming behind you. Imagine leaving a heritage of love and acceptance and grace for your family and friends. Imagine leaving very few things undone and unsaid to those you love most. Imagine leaving no regrets. What would you like your life to look like at the finish line? You see, the way we want our life to look at the finish line will determine how we choose to live today. So are we focused on the things that really matter to heaven and really matter to Jesus? Dean and I worked together for about four years. We parted on good terms, but there was a couple little stings there for both of us uh, previous to that. About a year later, I was invited to be the preacher during the memorial service at annual conference. The service was a celebration of life for all the pastors and spouses of pastors who had passed away during the previous year. It was a great honor to be invited, but there also was kind of a heavy responsibility with that. I was humbled by the opportunity to preach at one of the two most important worship services at any annual conference. I was even more humbled because that year one of the pastors we were remembering had been a very dear friend of mine. So I preached on living and loving in such a way that at the end of our life, we would have no regrets. Well, after worship, as the crowds of hundreds and hundreds dispersed, there I saw Dean. He had waited, and he was coming down towards me. Dean is uh, about like three foot taller than I am, okay? He's, he's tall, he's a big guy, you know? And uh, as he came close, he opened his arms. They can reach like a foot further than mine on both sides. And he just wrapped me up in his arms. He hugged me tight, and he got his mouth right by my ear, and he said, no regrets, Doug, no regrets. It was a God moment for both of us. It was also a learning moment. The most important thing for my soul is finishing well. I can finish well when I choose to focus my soul work on Jesus now and on my life in heaven later. From that time, I lived and loved in a different way. That big hug and those soft words changed me. I found myself living more and more with the finish line in mind, and I also found myself more often focused on the things that really matter to Jesus and to heaven. Now, the good news is this. Finishing well is possible for every single one of us. It begins when we focus our soul work on what is in heaven. Let us pray.